The warriors of Middenheim howled as the power of their god touched them, and their eyes shone with the light of winter. Their blades were death, and the Norsi saw the defeat of the dread lord of Karnath in the cold, merciless eyes of their foes. At each man's side, whether Middenlander or not, a shimmering wolf of blue fire snapped and bit at the Norsi, tearing open throats and clawing flesh from bones with ghostly paws. No blade could cut them, no armor could defy them, and the phantom wolves tore into the Norsi with all the power of their master. Terror overcame the Norsi, and they scattered before the tide of fiery wolves and winter warriors. The viaduct became a place of certain death with the wolves of the north and the men of the city hacking down their fleeing foes without mercy. Amid the howls of wolves and the screaming winds, there came another sound, a sound the defenders of Middenheim had almost despaired of hearing, great horns blowing wildly from a host of men. Then another army came from the forests, the swords of ten thousand men from all across the empire, from the east came the Asaborns, the Terusans, and the Talutans. A thousand chariots led by Queen Freya smashed into the Norsi, swiftly followed by the red skiffs of Count Krugar. Howling packs of Terusan wildmen fell upon the scattered beasts and men, their painted bodies glowing in the fire top the Fauschlag rock. From the south came the Andals and the Brigunians and the Menogoths, Warriors who had marched day and night to reach their emperor and fight at his side. The raven helms of the Endals rode down the Norsi fleeing from the viaduct, Count Aldred cutting a path through the northern tribesmen with arcing blows from Ulfshard. Princess Marika rode at midnight horse at her side, loosening arrows from a gracefully curved longbow. Merrigan's spearmen drove Norsi horsemen onto the blades of the Menegoths and the Brigundians, and Marcus and Sigurd relished the chance to lay waste to their enemies from afar. Ostagoth blade masters cut down Norsi champions with sword blows that were as deadly as they were elegant, while Count Adelhard's kingly blade laid waste to any who dared come near. Within the hour, the Fauschlag rock was surrounded by warriors of the Empire, and the Norsi were doomed. By nightfall, the flame of Ulrich had retreated to the ruined temple, the winter winds and ghostly wolves returning once more to the realm of the gods. The Empire was saved, and the sacrifice of Count Pendrag was mourned by all, and most of all by Emperor Sigma, Pendrag's closest friend. There would be righteous vengeance, and the men of the south were soon ready to see to it. Yet for now, it was a time of mourning, and a time for hearth and comfort. Vengeance had finally come. For long decades, the men of the South had endured the harsh depredations of the Northmen, and for so long, the men of the South had been their victims, with whole villages burned and people killed, all for the sake of appeasing an uncaring pantheon of ancient and evil gods, yet no more. This time, there would be a reckoning, and there would be one soon. This was a righteous cause, for unlike the Robsmen who never truly sought the suffering of their fellow man, the Norsi reveled in it, and their death and destruction would only be a blessing to the world. Thus did Sigma lead his empire against the Norsi once more. Great marauding fleets of warriors and raiders began to scour the coastline of Norska, Emperor Sigma made the mistake of sparing the Norsi once. Now he was determined not to make the same mistake again, and soon Sigma would finally enact his fateful vengeance against the man he once called brother. In time, tribe after tribe fell to the swords, axes, and spears of the southern raiders, whole settlements crushed by the righteous warriors of the Heldenhammer. In an ironic twist of fate, it was the Norsi who became the victims of raids, whilst the men of the south became the reavers from across the sea. There was no quarter for those they've killed, for the Norsi deserved nothing more than they got. Men, women, and children were butchered to the very last, and none wept a tear for their deaths. 
In time, fear began to creep into the hearts of all the Northmen tribes, and now and forever, the Norse would know that the Empire was a foe they would forever respect as their equal. Yet for all that Emperor Sigmar had achieved, he had yet to find the man known as Gerion, the man who killed Ravenna, and the man who betrayed not only him, but his entire people. It was sweet irony, then, that the last village he and his warriors put to the torch not only had the man the Emperor had sought for so long, but also that he once more escaped, and with him came a young boy, a boy who would in his later years become an even greater warrior than Gerion, now known as Azazel. This boy held the name of Morka, and were it not for his friend Wolfgar to abandon the chase, perhaps the greatest threat Emperor Sigmar would ever know would have been adverted, and once again Sigmar made another foolish mistake. Yet, even as the Empire breathed a sigh of relief and gloried themselves upon their achievements, the tribes failed to notice the cold winds of death blowing strongly from the south. Even as Sigmar basked himself in his triumphant homecoming victory far to the south, Count Marcus of the Menegoths was burying the body of his only son until a stranger appeared in the scene. He bore the caramel skin of Nehekara, Yet there was a paleness to his appearance which contrasted with his own skin. In mere moments, the encounter turned violent, and a hulking undead warrior clad in chaos armor strode through the melee, butchering all of Count Marx's warriors. Even as the end drew near, a dark, looming shadow appeared behind the two creatures, and as the tan stranger choked the life out of the Imperial Count, Marcus knew his name a name which was the very personification of death. The looming shadow was known as Nagash. Word didn't reach Sigmar about the Menegoth's destruction, at least not until the very same caramel stranger met the Emperor when he came to the woods looking for an ancient weapon known as an organ gun. There the stranger gave Sigmar an ultimatum. Give up the crown of sorcery and serve the will of his master, or his empire shall perish under a flood of dead. Brave Sigmar rejected the creature's claims, and as the creature fled the scene upon a night-black hellsteed, the emperor once again rallied the empire for war. Yet the empire needed time, and time was against them. As Sigmar rallied his knights and mustered his warriors, the capital of the Menegoths was raised by the, to the ground by the invading hordes of Nagash. Worse still, mighty fleets of undead corsairs plagued the trade lines to the west, blocking off many ships heading towards the growing city of Trutonsrik. When Sigmar rallied the armies, he came upon the Cherusian settlement of Ostengard, now overtaken by the undead. Even as the settlement was purged, reports from all across the empire began to stream in that the dead were rising everywhere. Settlements from the southern middle mountains were abandoning their homes, and the refugees were streaming into Middenheim in a great flood. Western settlements had begun to be raided by beastmen and brigades as a foul pestilence and the onset of winter forced these creatures into desperation. Soon, it became apparent that the final battle would take place within the gates of Reichdorf itself. Salvation and revelation came to the Empire when Sigmar's most trusted advisor, Eoforth, high scholar of the Empire, delved deep into the great libraries of Reichdorf. There, a great many of the most useful tomes had come from the dusty library of Morath, the necromancer of Brass Keep, though copies of translated manuscripts from the far south had come to Reichdorf's great library via the Empire's southern kings. Oral tales told by traders returning from the southern lands of searing deserts or from across the world edge mountains had been painstakingly compiled by the library's scribes. There, the scholar learned of the true nature of the being known as Nagash. 
Nagash was a figure only dimly recalled in ancient legends and the pages of dusty tomes to the men of the Reich. But Sigma alone had known the truth of it, for when he faced the necromancer of the brass keep, he claimed from him Nagash's fabled crown of sorcery. Through it, the Lord of the Undead sought to entice Sigma to be his champion, but his magic proved futile against Sigma's will, who then placed the crown in a guarded vault under the care of Chilean priestesses. Inextricably linked with the tale of Nagash was the tale of the crown he had forged and into which he had bound the essence of his damned soul. This, the ancient tale-tellers agreed, was the source of Nagash's greatest power and his greatest weakness. The manuscript from the burning galley spoke of an ancient warrior named al Kadizar, who slew the Lord of Undeath with a dreadful sword of fell power and cast his bones and crown into a great river. A green-skin invasion had destroyed the city. Everywhere the crown appeared in history. Great devastation quickly followed. Terrible invasions, cataclysms of dreadful power, or corruptions of once noble civilizations into barbarism. The crown was a talisman of woe, a bringer of destruction that brought only misery and death whenever it came to light, and was buried in the heart of Reichdorf. Driven with utter terror, the scholar rushed with all haste to bring this news to Emperor Sigma before it was too late. Swollen by the Menegoth dead, the army of Nagash pressed further north and took the city of Sigurdheim in a matter of days. Thousands of undead warriors had marched up the rugged peak and broke through its defences, and the city fell in a night that held sway over the tribal territories of the cosmopolitan southerners. The Count, Sigurd, was slain in combat by a vampire and returned from death as a white, just as his vassal, Count Marcus, had before him. Soon, for every victory won, the legions of the undead were growing to near apocalyptic numbers. It was not a mere whim that Nagash had divided his forces so, for he had sought to deprive the Empire of its greatest strength, unity. His forces assailed every province, even as far as the great city of Middenheim. His purpose was not to destroy or conquer, but simply to keep the tribes from riding to the defence of their emperor, even as he rode hard to Reichdorf. Nagash's baleful eyes were turned upon the great capital, for he knew that his ancient crown and his final victory would be found there. The death of the Brigundians forced the Asaborn, close friends of the Brigundians, to move their hand, and began a muster of nearly three thousand warriors and hundreds of charioteers. With their mighty warrior queen leading them, Countess Freya led her host south upon the banks of the river Stir, where the Asaborns met their foe and were utterly vanquished. What remained of Freya's forces returned to their capital of three hills, where they prepared themselves to leave and head to Reichdorf. Of the Asserborns, none had found Queen Freya. To the far west, upon the port city of Marburg, the armies of both the Endals and Jutones made ready to weather the assault of Nagash's undead fleet. Jutone lances and Endal archers mounted the walls and battlements of the city when the first undead forces arrived. As the undead fleet made ready for landfall, a whole battery of catapults and ballistae sank ship after ship that came too close. Yet as the skies darkened with hordes of fell bats, the numbers of the dead soon overwhelmed the defenders, and in desperation, the Andals and Tritones were forced back into the mighty citadel fortress of the city, where they made their last stand. Sigmar, realizing that he could only coordinate the imperial armies from his seat at Reichdorf, rode from the victory at Ostengard to the capital, accompanied by Count Krugar's red skiffs. Along the way, 
Sigma lifted the siege of the city of three hills, allowing what remained of the Asserborns to follow him to Reichdorf to reinforce the city's defences. Queen Freya had miraculously survived the depredations of Nagash's forces, and had fought her way through the empire's infested southlands to her emperor's side at Reichdorf, adding to the defence of the city the remains of her shattered war host and a contingent of dwarfs led by Master Alaric had also come west, both to aid their allies and to write a grudge upon one of Nagash's champions. Yet like a creeping sickness, the armies of Nagash spread throughout the empire, hordes of the dead enslaved to the will of the ancient necromancer like warhounds on a fraying leash bound together by a web of dark sorcery with Nagash at its centre. The armies of the dead jealously strangled the life from the land of mortals. The southernmost reaches of the empire were already enveloped in darkness, but across the empire, scattered lights of resistance flared brightly against the encroaching shadow. The palisade forts of the Udosi were besieged by corpses of ragged flesh, while other clans were pushed into bleak highland valleys where they fought desperate battles for survival. Count Karsten gave battle from the parapets of Wolfila's rebuilt castle, his army a patchwork of warriors from a dozen different clans. Welded together by the common foe, they fought as brothers, though they scrapped like bitter foes in times of peace. In the east, Count Adelhard led daring hit-and-run attacks against the dead, riding at the heads of glorious winged lances, whooping with excitement as they charged hither and thither through the ranks of the dead with wild abandon. The Ostagoths did not build cities. Their people living in settlements that could be broken down at a moment's notice and loaded onto wagons for transport. The dead had no focus for their assault, and the Ostagoth cavalry armies encircled and destroyed their enemies with ease. The Cherusans and Talutans took refuge behind the walls of their great cities. Krugar fought heroically on the spiked walls of Talahim, the great crater city that nestled like a giant eye in the enormous expanse of the great forest. Always where the fighting was thickest, Krugar hewed the undead with glittering sweeps of Utensial. Further west, Aloysius defended Hohregig with all the wild fury for which his kinsmen were famed. Forced to fight with every weapon available, many of the Cherusans chewed Wildroot and drove themselves into bloody frenzies. Atop the spire of the Fauschlag rock, Mercer and his warriors hurled the dead from the walls of their soaring city. The cliff-like sides of the rock writhed with climbing horrors, yet the city still held. Mercer's rune fang shone with simple purity, and where it smote, the dead could not resist its power. Count Otwin's lands were near empty, his people scattered by the sudden invasion of the dead from the wastelands to the northwest, long shunned by the living. These lands had vomited forth the ravenous tide of the dead that had driven the Thuringians from their lands. Many now fought in Middenheim, or had since fled to Marburg. Jutondrik was a city of the dead, its streets empty of life and infested with degenerate cannibal creatures. Even if this war against Nagash could be won, Jutondrik would forever be a forsaken and damned place, where no soul would seek to live again. Its great buildings and stone walls would fall into disrepair, and within the span of a lifetime, no one would know that men had once lived there. Further south in Marburg, the dead hurled themselves at the walls of a great citadel, but the defenders here were resolute and filled with determination to hold the line. Here, the power of the undead seemed weakest, as though a turning point in the battle for Marburg had been reached, and mortals now had the upper hand. Nevertheless, the cost was high, for Count Aldred no longer was amongst the living. When Sigmar returned to the imperial capital, he soon heard news that his scholars had found the necromancer's weakness before they were killed, 
such was the price of knowledge. From his last dying breath, the Emperor found out that it was not some long-forgotten nemesis or weapon that would save the Empire, but rather a character trait that could be exploited. The great necromancer's every last thought was bent upon reclaiming his crown, and every step he took towards it fanned the fury of that desire. He would abandon all cunning and craft upon reaching Reichdorf, that he might claim it and fully restore himself at last. In that, Sigmar saw the chance to destroy the laws of the undead. He would place the crown of sorcery once more upon his brow, goading Nagash to face him in battle and try to take it from him. He would turn the necromancer's gift against him. The host of Nagash arrived before the walls of Reichdorf on the leading edge of dark storm clouds. Winter cut the air, and the cold winds that blew from the vast horde of the undead carried the stench of mankind's rot. Chain lightning flashed in the clouds, and rumbles of thunder that seemed to roll out from the distant lands echoed strangely from the walls of the city's temples, taverns, and dwellings. No sun rose on this day, the unnatural darkness covering the land in a bleak shadow from which it could never more be lifted, a gloom that entered every mortal heart and filled it with the sure and certain knowledge of the fate of all living things. Skeletons marched at the fore of the army, ancient warriors in serried ranks that stretched from one line of the horizon to the other. Cursed to serve Nagash for all eternity, they wore armour of long-lost kingdoms, clutched weapons of strange design, and the grave dirt of far-off lands clung to their bones. Heavily armoured champions in heavier burks of scale and corsets of iron marched at their head, exalted warriors of the dead whose skill with the executioner's blades they carried was more terrifying than when they had been mortal. Where the warriors of bone resembled the army they had been in life, the thousands of bloody corpses dragged from shallow peasant graves or raised back from the dead in the wake of battle were a shambling mockery of life. Limping on twisted limbs and groaning with the torment of their existence, they were a stark reminder that even death in battle against this foe would be no escape from the horror. Hunched things in black robes move through the shuffling hordes of corpses, their fell sorcery directing its mindless hunger. Yet even as death itself clung to the gates, Sigma made one last pilgrimage to the Hill of Heroes, the last rest for the dead. There, Sigma once more buried another of his close friends, as the body of Eoforth was finally laid to rest upon the bodies of those he had served and loved. Offering up a prayer to Mor, Sigmar's only wish was that his friend would see the next life in peace. As the offering was burned in the moonlight, a host of ghosts crept up on Sigmar, but these weren't malevolent spirits, but ones Sigmar knew all too well. Before him were all those he had loved and lost in his life, his father Bjorn, and his close friends Pendrag and Trinovantes. The spirits came and took the body of Eoforth with them, each ghost slowly dissipating until only Bjorn remained. Bjorn pointed to Reichdorf, and Sigmund knew what he meant. Know them and understand them, for it will make you mighty. The words were not spoken, but Sigmund heard them as clearly as though his father had been standing in front of him. King Bjorn nodded, knowing that Sigma had understood his message. He moved off into the darkness and was soon lost to sight as his shade returned to the realms beyond the knowledge of mortals. Sigma sank to his knees, overcome with emotion. Galmaraz dropped to the ground and he buried his head in his hands. He wept as memories of his father and friends surged to the fore, but they were not tears shed in grief but in remembrance of all the joy they had shared in life. At last, his tears were spent, and Sigmar stood tall as he turned to look at the city below, heartened by the thousands of pinpricks of light that glittered in the darkness. With pride, he saw his people fight to the bitter end, 
and this flicker of hope was enough for the Emperor to finally face his true destiny at last. With a strong heart, Sigma rallied the entire city to him, telling them of their proud heritage and the entire empire, of all the tribes and of all classes, peasants, warriors and nobles sallied forth from the gates of their city to face the undead on the banks of the River Reich. Sigmar led the charge, his mighty hammer cleaving to and from. The momentum of the Imperial charge was devastating, but slowly the tides began to turn as the numbers of the dead soon outnumbered the living. As the battle raged, thousands more dead warriors were advancing towards the city, pushing past the tiny islands of resistance that had met with some fleeting success. The battle line of mortals arrayed before the walls was fighting with admirable courage, but no hope of victory. They took backward step after step, and was only a matter of time before they broke. Soon, with a great surge of dark magic, Nagash invoked the dead from every yard within the lands, and thousands upon thousands more clawed their way to the surface. It seemed as if the Empire was finally doomed. Yet in the centre of the battle, cut off from the rest of his army, Sigmar drove for the low hillside when Nagash awaited him. Less than a hundred warriors still rode with the Emperor, yet they charged as though all of mankind was with them. Feeling the weight of the crown on his brow grow heavier with every step his horse took towards the hillside, Sigma felt its anger at him surge, a fury that a mere mortal dared to wield it, and not dreams of pleasure, nightmares of failure, and temptations of wealth, power, and godhood. None could reach Sigma, for he had reached that place where all thoughts of self were extinguished. All that was left to him now was service to his people, and not even death could keep him from that duty. Piece by piece, Sigma had shed all his earthly desires, putting them aside for the greater good of the Empire. At his side was his dear friend, Wolfgard. The fearsome warrior's bravery in the face of Counter's revenants cleared a path for his lord through his enemies. Wolfgard's heroism allowed Sigma to face Nagash in single combat. The Lord of Men and the Lord of Death and great was Nagash's rage at seeing his crown worn by a mortal man, as well as his desire to at last claim it so that he could arise again from the ashes. Yet Nagash was a being far greater than even Sigmar could imagine. And though he had Galmaraz in his hand, the Emperor was struck by power so strong and magic so fell that he was forced upon his knees. As Sigma stood on the threshold of death, trying desperately to hold against the dark will of Nagash, as all hope seemed lost to the north, a great army of fanatics arrived with the horizon, and in that moment of distraction, Sigma was freed from his will and took the crown off his brow. Nagash's greed led him to reach for his crown with outstretched fingers when Sigma cast it off and goaded Nagash to take it. Such desire and obsession, such aching need and devotion. Nothing else mattered to Nagash, not the defeat of Sigma's army, not the destruction of all living things. Nothing was more important to the necromancer than this crown. In this, just as the Heldenham had expected, Nagash had made his faux pas, leaving himself vulnerable for a thunderous sweep of Galmaraz. The mighty hammer of the dwarfs smashed into Nagash's cuirass, breaking it into a thousand shards and powering into his chest. Green fire flared from the impact, and ribs fused with dark magic thousands of years old shattered like ice as Sigmar drove his hammer into the heart of the necromancer's being. Sigmar howled with the wolves and screamed his hatred of Nagash as the runic script on the hammer's shaft shone with the purest light. Runes he had not even known existed flared to life on the hammer's head, filling Nagash's hollow existence with fiery beams of light and searing his immortal essence from within. 
The necromancer shrieked as his ancient sorcery fought to resist the powerful magic of the dwarves. Forces too titanic to be understood by mortals battle within his body, easily capable of laying waste to this entire land. Sigma held onto Galmaraz as the star iron of its head burned brighter than the sun and its grip burned his hands with its ancient fire. The necromancer gave one last shriek of horror and his body exploded in a wash of black light and frozen fire. Dark magic and immortal energies flared upwards from his destruction like a volcanic eruption, and the sky filled with ashes and grief. With Nagash's apparent death, his army withered away without his magic to sustain them, nor was Nagash's influence confined to the dead of the Reichdorf, for the black strands of his web of control stretched all across the empire. The dead at Marburg dropped to the ground as the will driving them over the citadel walls faded into nothingness, while those clawing their way into Middenheim fell from the causeway and tumbled from the sheer sides of the Fauschlag rock. The Odossi watched in amazement as the dead ceased their attacks into their hidden valleys and crumbled to dust around the walls of Colin Carsten's cliff-top fortress. The remaining stragglers were easily defeated without the necromancer's will to guide them, and the loss of the vampire leadership when Sigmar cast them away with a word, cursing them to be his enemies and the enemies of his heirs till the end of times. In the aftermath of the battle, realizing in his wisdom that the threats to assail his empire would be of a magical nature as well as mortal, Sigmar declared his intention to establish an order of the Empire's greatest warriors, a cabal known as the Order of the Silver Hammer. The direct precursors of the Holy Order of the Templars of Sigma, as they were later known under the reign of Magnus the Pious, but more commonly known as the Witch Hunters. Sigmar's victory over Nagash would be short-lived, for soon after, the Emperor would face his last and greatest challenge. This ancient war had long been forgotten, and none truly know the true extent of its devastation. It was Sigmar's greatest triumph, the great struggle against the armies of the Norsi ever chosen Morkar, the Uniter of the Talos tribe, who had risen to ascendancy in the eyes of the Dark Gods as the first of their ultimate champions. Charged with establishing the mortal realm as the kingdom of chaos and thirsting for vengeance against Sigmar for destroying his clansmen during his reprisal raids against the north. Having gathered a great army from amongst the Norse and other races sworn to chaos, the Uniter led his host of warriors south. Little is known of the invasion, but it is clear that it was one of the most earth-shattering in all of the Empire's ancient history. Few of the wars of its modern age could possibly compare to its scale of devastation and destruction. With Morkar's victories, the powers of chaos surged from the north, bathing the world in the breath of the Dark Gods. With such power, the demons of the realm of chaos materialized in the mortal world, and marched alongside the ranks of the Norsemen. With each city that fell, Morkar avenged the long dead of his fallen tribe, thirsting only to cross blades with he who had led the charge. Eventually, Sigmar rallied the imperial armies and faced Morkar and his Norsi. Once more did the men of the south do battle against the indomitable warriors of the north. In the battle, Sigmar faced the terrible skull taker of corn and dealt a terrible blow upon the thing's vile head that saw it destroyed and banished back to corn's halls. Thus was Uzul defeated for the first and last time, forever carrying the legacy of his humiliation at Sigmar's hands upon his scarred horns. But little was this compared to the titanic duel between Sigmar and Morkar and the mortal world has never before, nor since, seen the equal of that cataclysmic clash of titans. 
For a day and a night did Sigmar duel the champion of the northern gods, in a battle likened to that between gods themselves. The fury of their combat did rend apart the sky, and split the ground asunder with peals of thunder, strikes of lightning, and raging torrents of fire. The two avatars of the gods matched their arms in such glorious contest. At last, they had found their equals. Regardless, the ever-chosen, though he had come closer than all others to ending Sigmar's life, was nonetheless defeated and struck down by the Emperor's mighty hammer. The destruction caused by the first of the great chaos incursions was thus ended with Mordekar's downfall, and thus his staggeringly mighty army was driven back to the north. Finally, at his fiftieth year of his reign, a great event would occur. In that year, Emperor Sigmar Heldenhammer, greatest of all of mankind's rulers, stood up from his throne, placed down his crown, and took up Galmaraz, and walked out of the great hall of his capital. He passed Wolfgard and his chosen bodyguard, who were roaring with laughter at some jest or remembrance of times past. He strode down the path towards the market square where folk haggled and bartered with loud voices and good humour. He passed them, smelling roasting meat and hearing the merry making of children playing in the gutters as he had done in his youth so many years before. Down the streets he walked, where men sat and gambled or sparred with one another and women folk talked with babes on their hips or prepared food for the next meal or, having already cooked it, ate broth and beans out of earthenware pipkin balanced on their knees. Girls sat in groups, busy over fine embroidery. Sigmar saw life carry on in all its vibrancy as he walked by, unnoticed by all. Out through the iron-bound gate, he walked and down the well-worn track. Carts rumbled past, bringing trade and wealth into the town. On either side the fields were tended by men and women, sowing seeds from baskets hung around their necks. Children ran behind them, beating drums and yelling to frighten off the greedy crows that circled overhead. He saw sheep and goats grazing peacefully, overlooked by shepherds. Then into the forest he plunged, journeying eastwards towards the mountains. He passed foresters as they cleared the track of fallen branches and laid traps for game. They carried hunting bows and axes and were accompanied by their hounds. But the beasts did not pick up Sigmar's scent, who blessed them silently as he passed. When he emerged from the forest onto the eastward plain, he was no longer alone. On his left trotted a wild, grey-headed wolf, and on his right was a giant boar with black tusks. As he set off up the hillside, they followed at his heels faithfully. The wolf with his wildness and courage, the boar with his wits and tenacity. When Sigmar reached the top of the hill, he turned. Before him, and sweeping out to the north and west, was the forest. Cutting through it in all directions were roads. Every town, village, and settlement was connected. Travellers and tradesmen moved like ants over them, spreading news and prosperity wherever they went. Troops of warriors tramped and cavalry cantered about the land, lending the populace protection from danger. Smoke rose high in the sky from the villages, which were burgeoning into towns which in turn were growing into cities. And wherever Sigmar looked, he could see the strength of mankind grow. Through him, the tribes were united in a common cause. Enemies lurked everywhere, but together men would overcome them. Sigmar looked at what he had forged with his strength, cunning and courage, and he knew his work had come to an end. It was time for others to take up his mantle and forge an indomitable empire. For the land and unity he had created was greater than any one man any one dynasty. It belonged to the people it had been made for, and would be guarded by their strength, existing eternally in their minds and souls. They were all his heirs, who would take up his mantle 
and rule the land in his absence. Raising his mighty hammer in honor of the indomitable spirit of humanity and praise of Ulric, who had, in his benevolence, granted him victory, Sigma offered one final goodbye to the people he so loved. He had only one last journey yet to make. Behind him rose the heads of the world's edge mountains. He turned to them, and without a backward glance, marched towards his final destiny and his place, earned through great deeds, unsurpassed courage, and much bloodshed and pain in the everlasting pantheon of the gods.